Welcome to this episode of the Women in Money Cafe. What Catherine and I are going to cover off today is something that we got asked about a lot when we were in Clubhouse. And obviously, because it couldn't be recorded, all that information has now disappeared. So we thought we would do it again so that you've got this information to hand and you can refer back to it as well. So it's how to save and invest for your children, because there are a few more options out there than possibly you realize. And it's just knowing how to go about it, why you would use one option over the other, and then getting your kids involved as well. So mm. hope you enjoy it. Right. Morning, Catherine. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. So I think the word you said in that sentence that stuck out for me is the the why. And I think that's going to help as you and I go through sharing what we've done with our kids, choosing what might be right for you. And I think the why really helps you define out of all the options for cash savings and the investment options for children might suit for you. So should we kick start with cash options? Shall we do the PlayStation story? Let's do the PlayStation story, because this is how it all started back in, I think it was January 2021, it must have been. Yeah. So PlayStation 5 had come onto the market, but it was like nigh on impossible to get hold of. And Owen really, really wanted one. And he had enough money in the bank for it. And this led to Owen asking me, how did all that money get there? Uh, What's it all about? And so I ended up drawing a picture for Owen. So Owen gets the same rubbish pictures that all my clients get. And he ended up with, he's got three buckets of money. So bucket number one, back then it was actually Rooster. But now he's got a cake card with Sterling. So this is where his pocket money goes each week. And that's for Owen to do with as he pleases. Okay, so be that Roblox, Fortnite, Lego, whatever. Owen's in charge of that money. He makes the decisions. Then there is bucket number two, which is, I want to call it a proper bank. It's not that Starling's not a proper bank, a traditional high street bank. That's what we'll call it. And much to originally his resistance, every Christmas and every birthday, he'd be given money because we've got quite a big extended family. And the deal is that half of the money goes in his savings and half of it is for him to do as he chooses. So the money that built up in the bank was his savings from his birthday and his Christmas money. And I explained to him through the years how that money going in there, I'd use that to buy big things for him. So like the slide and the swings out in the back garden. But now he's getting older, he can choose what to spend the big money on. So he's got his everyday money in Starling. He's got his big savings for the big things, and that's how he could buy a PS5. And then I explained to him, you've also got investments, at which point he's like, what? (laughs) I said, so since you were born, Gran and I put money aside every month into an investment for you. So your Starling money just gets spent and it doesn't make any money. The bank gets a little bit of interest and explained to him how interest worked. I said, then the investments, so if, Starling is now, the savings are, are soon, the investments are later. That's money you're going to need much later on in life. And that's in a thing that makes a lot more money than the bank can. Mm. So that's how I explain to him how his money's organised. Oh. And I think what you've covered off there is what we talk to about with our, with our own clients, even as adults, is having the, the spending money available, then having cash for things that you want to buy sometimes they get called sinking funds but you know what I'm like with words to me I'd rather give it a positive name and then anything into that longer term would go into investments and it's not dissimilar to the the structure that I've got with mine they've got their ready available money they've got their cash for bigger items that they save some to and then they have their investments I think the only slight difference is they choose from let's say they get given £100 for Christmas, they will make a decision, there'll be a conversation, what's going into ready money, what's going into the soon money, and what's going into investment. But it's usually kind of like 30, 30, 40, or 20. Depends what depends what they want. If they know that they're saving up for something, they might put more into soon rather than the now. But otherwise, pretty much the same. Also, Starling, 
<laughs> also <laughs> high street bank and then also investments so i mean obviously we use starling we talk about it a lot but there are other options out there and there are a range of high street banks with children's accounts available should we just touch on some of the cash options before diving into the investment options shall i run you through some of the bank accounts for kids and then do you want to touch on some of the appy type things yeah so of course Right now, if you've got, if your kids have got a bank account, okay, in all interest rates are rubbish, okay, I can't dress that up for you, but some of them are marginally less rubbish than others. So today, at the time of recording, which is the 9th of July, okay, if you're looking for good kids' accounts, HSBC in at 3%, Virgin Money in at 227 you, from a regular saving point of view, if you're putting away each month, then you want to look at Saffron and Principality Building Societies. Another one to check out if you live in England, okay, is Halifax. Halifax will pay 2.5% for a year. Halifax will not work for us people up in Scotland. I'm afraid I looked into it because you need to go into a branch and we don't have them. So that's what you can get on normal bank accounts for kids. From a cash point of view, then, Catherine, do you want to touch about, we mentioned Kate that we use. Yeah, so the one that sprung to mind for me was Go Henry. So it's more like a debit card app, but there's still parental control in and around it. So they have the freedom, but without total autonomy so parents can track their expenses so it can be used for the kind of daily spends when you set and setting a spending limit in and around that one I think I, because I use Starling and they've got their kite card I'm happy with that one because again I can see it it's digital banking which I think the generation of children that we have that's their banking of the future so then they're not seeing cash as much as we used to so they do need to learn those money skills and the money habits also in that kind of one removed digital version. That was the second one that popped up into my mind. Have you got any more that you're springing to mind? No, I mentioned the owner and I started with an app called Rooster. And in some ways, Rooster is superior to Kate with Starling because that's just a bank card. It doesn't do anything else. Okay. But we use the Rooster app because we could set, we set on weekly missions, which sounds a lot more fun than tasks and jobs, doesn't it? And if he completed his missions, he'd get closer to getting his pocket money for the week. But it was just a way of recording what was going on. But he could set up different pots of money in it. So he could set up his little pot for what he was going to spend. He could also send out a little pot to save. And he could put a picture on it and he could set a goal on it. You could also set it up that it worked out interest as well. So if you wanted to get them used to the idea that if you leave money in the bank and you earn interest, it gets bigger. So it had things like that. You could also choose if you wanted to give away some of your money. So it was also encouraging the idea of charity as well. So the Rooster app for younger children is a really good place to start too. Yeah. And I think the the nice thing is that one's free. It's got some bonus features with a small price, I think, if I remember rightly. I, th- I don't actually know any others other than those three. Go Henry, Rooster Money, and then obviously Starling. What else is there that you're aware of other than things like where they've tied it to maths puzzles and kind of chores for payment? That's not really a savings account, is it? No, I think they're the big ones. That's really kind of ca- covering off cash. The only thing we haven't mentioned is junior cash ISAs. Mm. So with a junior cash ISA, the interest rate is going to be probably comparable with what you're going to get on the children's savings account. There's not going to be a huge difference between the two of them. I think maybe that leads us on to then. Let's talk about junior ISAs in general, Catherine. Yeah, I did make a sound inadvertently when you said junior ISA because I think the cash in junior ISA, there's so little to to do you know there's no real reason to do it anymore so for me when I think about investing for my children when I think about saving and investing for my children the junior ISA is in the investment category because you can get that interest rate within a, a usual cash account so there's no real reason that I can see at the moment for having a cash junior ISA that's not a recommendation that's my opinion so junior ISAs you can have a cash one as we've covered but you can have them invested in stocks and shares the allowance is the same in total for junior ISAs, and it's £9,000, can be put into a child's ISA every single year. It can't be carried over. 
does have to be set up by mom or dad, parents. But once set up, anyone can contribute. So all of mine have had a junior ISA invested. In fact, what, they used to begin as these old child trust funds when you used to get a government voucher. And if you do have one of those kicking around, you can transfer that into a junior ISA. So I'm going to just use Oliver as an example. So he has an AJ Bell ISA because he can send a link to any family member if they want to contribute. So my dad, for example, likes to make the most of his gifting allowances each year and put money into the children's ISAs. So he just gets a link, he tops up the AJ Bell ISA, and then Oliver and I will sit down and choose where to invest it. So I gave him a selection of funds based on things important for him. And he did pick the funds and he will sit there with me and invest. And when the markets, I mean, the markets are down at the moment. So he did his usual quarterly check. He knew that they were going to be down because we talked about all the reasons it might be. And so when he saw all the reds, he didn't flinch. He didn't panic. And I think that's good experience for him. So that you know, if he'd been the adult seeing that for the first time and feeling that loss, then I think that that's a harder journey. So his attitude was it's red. That means it's good, isn't it? Because I can buy more for my money. So he just sees it as a sale in a clothing store that now I get the chance to buy in cheap. So I've mentioned AJ Bell. Again, there are hundreds of providers you can do direct from a high street bank. You can do a platform, which is what AJ Bell is, which is kind of like a financial supermarket. You can go sort of directly and just in buy a junior ISA and not buy it but I'm thinking in particular if you are wanting maybe an ethical one I'm thinking there's one such as Climate that you could potentially go and have one we've only got access to to ethical funds in there but my preference for me and my son is a platform because we can have other products alongside it to add on junior ISAs there Jules I would like it, please, if you could just explain the concept of the platform and how it works a bit more for people. Okay, so I see a platform like a supermarket, but for financial products. So it really is just giving you access to, for example, an ISA, a junior ISA, a pension, or even a general investment, which is the same as the other two, but not nicely wrapped up in a tax efficient wrapper. So it has different rules. Once you go into that supermarket, that financial supermarket, you then go like in the supermarket, you go to the aisle you want. So I've gone to the junior ISA aisle in this particular case. And now that I'm there, I'm going to select the items from the shelves and put them in my basket. So in that particular instance, that could be individual stocks and shares. My preference is always funds, go for diversity, let someone else do the, the clever thinking. Then I've got it at a, a lower cost. So you will pay a small platform at fee to access those products. And then you will pay a cost for the funds. But the idea is that you will benefit from investing so that those costs, even though they are there, they are still giving you access to making money in the future, even on the days when it's down, trusting that it will come back up. All right. That's brilliant. Thank you. I just thought we use the word platform all the time. A lot of people mm -hmm. have gone, mm, what is this? Yeah. So <clears throat> in olden days, before we had platforms, Let's say you wanted an investment from company A and you wanted some of company B and a bit of company C. You had to deal with three separate companies and you had three lots of paperwork coming and it was just, it was horrible. And now you just have the platform and you can go in and buy everything inside the platform. So administratively, it's just easier. So Catherine's yeah. mentioned AJ Bell. The big one you've probably heard of is Hargreaves Landstone. Then there's mm -hmm. other ones like Interactive Investor. There's loads of them out there that are just there to make life easier for you to go and buy all the sort of financial investmenty things you want in one place. Yeah. Okay. So you you guys have taken the time to go and pick your platform and you're picking your investments to go in it and all the different funds and you're reviewing it quarterly and you're all of that. Now, if you're listening to this and you're thinking oh my god I don't want to do that there is another way okay because my son is obviously lazier than Catherine's kids <laughs> and he has got zero <laughs> interest in picking funds may I got that from his mother I don't know so from an investment point of view you don't need to be trying to figure out all the different stuff that you need to pick all right so Owen is with a different platform it's called Parmenian if anybody wants to know and he doesn't want to be checking it. 
And he doesn't really care what it's doing and he doesn't want involved with it. He just wants it to do what he wants it to do, which is grow. So you get what I call point and shoot funds, Mm. (laughs) where it's built around whatever risk you're comfortable with. So if we were to really crudely put it on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is crazy risk. (laughs) Oh, says, well, I want that, don't I? Because I'm not going to be touching it for ages. Like, okay. So you can get a fund or a portfolio built to your risk and it just goes off and does its thing and it will keep doing that and you don't need to do anything. So you can go and get one fund that will do everything for you or you can do what Catherine's done and go out and pick a selection. So you can be as hands-on or as hands-off as you want. Yeah. There is another way, which is more on the, the point and shoot. So instead of going to a platform where you have access to lots of products and lots of funds, whether you're picking them point and shoot with risk or individually. Alternatively, you can go via the, the digital web, the apps. So for example, it's kind of might fall under the umbrella of robo advice in that you will get maybe a choice of five funds that are risk rated. So you could go, for example, to Moneybox where there's a junior ISA, you at Wealthify, I think do a junior ISA, I need to double check that. The Beanstalk app, so you're with one provider, they set the junior ISA up for you, you have it as an app, and then you're, you're, they will select based on your risk, which portfolio are going to recommend for you, maybe out of a choice of four or five. Yeah, another thing on the robos, all right, the robo advisors, the apps that are really, really simple and easy to use, is mm-hmm. if you hunt around, my first port of call would be the MSE website, some of them do deals. So I used Wealthify for a while because it meant I got £40 thrown into my ISAR. Yeah. So there's another one, sometimes they do fee-free for a year. So if mm-hmm. you're going down that route, have a little hunt around and see if there's any deals before you sign up. Yeah. And also remember that you can transfer your apps from your ISAs. So just because you started with somewhere doesn't mean it has to stay there for the next 18 years potentially so you can if you wanted to start a new one in the new year for your new nine thousand pound allowance there's nothing to say that you couldn't if you wanted to also transfer in an existing one from elsewhere absolutely we like shopping around it i don't like i'm just generally disloyal i think that's my problem <laughs> i know i don't think it's disloyal your loyalty is to you Yes, and to my money and my children's money. I would love to know if you're using any of those. Obviously, we're not recommending one or the other. So do do your research. I do like Julie's suggestion of checking out Money Saving Expert, wasn't it, that you suggested? That yeah. Was? And obviously, the other thing to always check is you just want to make sure that the FCA authorised and that it's protected by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. It should have exactly. all that on that. If it doesn't have that on it, run a mile so, and if it makes any guarantees or promises or anything quick then run even quicker yeah there's nothing that scares me more as a financial advisor than when something's got the word guaranteed on it yeah in my over 20 years of doing this anything that's had the word guaranteed on it has gone horribly wrong <laughs> i mean i think the nice thing about investing for children going back to the ups and the downs is it's if you start from when they're born or when they're very young You've got that long-term horizon anyway, because they simply cannot access it until they're 18. So those ups and those downs are going to happen. So show them. So when they do take it over, you've got them engaged and in and prepared for that. So it might be that they don't invest what you've invested through their childhood. At least if they are then become an adult investor, they are prepared for, for those ups and downs. They understand and can see that you consistently put in And it consistently went up and down (laughs) and ultimately grew. So I think if you do have one already for your children, don't keep it a secret and da-da on their 18th birthday because you've not prepared them. And I think some of the things I've heard parents say is that I don't want to give it to them at 18 and they blow it. You've got all of those years to prepare them for that. Obviously, my two eldest two have theirs. They did not blow it. They were extremely sensible with with their choices. And I think that's partly because of all the conversations we had in and around it during those times. Okay, so that brings us on to the issue of what if you don't want a junior ISA? Because the thing to understand about the junior ISA is ultimately 
it's theirs. So they can take over the operation of it from age 16. And from age 18, they can do with it what they want. Now, if you don't want to do that, what are the options, Catherine? So I think there's two obvious options that jump to mind. I'll mention them both and maybe we'll start digging deeper into one of them. The first one would be what's called a general investment, but with a child, it would be either a designated account or wrapped in a bear trust. So it's effectively the same in that it's an investment. It just doesn't benefit from the tax efficiency of a junior ISA. And there are options with that trust to add a little bit more control as to when they can have that. Then the second option would be one of our favourites, which is a pension. Obviously, they're not going to get it at 18 or 21 for university. They will have to wait till retirement age. But even if you just saved during childhood, it's there growing for them. You've given them that head start. So those are the two options that aren't immediately available to them at 18. I think you've got a general investment for Owen, haven't you, Julie? I have. And that's just, it's not because I don't trust Owen. I just don't like rules. <laughs> And there are rules with the eyes. And I'm like, I don't want to be confined by the rules. So we went down the general investment account route. And I always think of a general investment account. It's like a naked ISA. <laughs> so I want you to picture a pot of money. And an ISA has got a nice badge stuck on the front of it that says tax free. And the general investment account doesn't have the badge. So it's naked. All right. But the likelihood of me actually having to pay tax and that's really, really slim because potentially the general investment account is liable to income tax and capital gains tax. OK, so let's tackle the income tax one first of all. OK, if we go for a growth portfolio, so I don't have any bonds in there, so that's not generating income and all the stocks are really low dividend. So that's not really going to trigger an income tax liability either. So I'm not too worried about that. Capital gains tax then is the next thing to worry about. How likely am I to trigger a capital gains tax liability? Well, not very bloody likely, okay, because I've got a capital gains tax allowance that I can use every year. And there are ways that you can offset capital gains as you go along. So if it's grown to such a point that you think, oh, I might trigger that, what you can do is you sell some of it before that and you go and buy some other stuff and you'd reset the price so the capital gains can be managed. So effectively, you can make a general investment account virtually tax-free. So I think what it sounded like you were saying is there are ways to basically make it tax-free in that it may still trump the, the ISA because its nakedness gives you more flexibility. Now, I'm going to say this, Julian, I'm going to ask you to sense check whether my memory and understanding is if... A grandparent opens up the general investment for the child rather than the parent. So if grandparents want to invest and they want to open up a general investment account for their grandchildren, that's absolutely fine. They can do that and they'll nominate the children as it being their account. But it will still be taxed on the grandparents. But if you want to access the children's income tax brackets and nobody's paying tax, I'll explain in a second, place the investment inside a bear trust. Once it's inside the bear trust, all right, we all get to earn so much money each year that we don't pay any income tax on. So do kids. It's highly unlikely that your kids are going to breach that bracket. So effectively, you've made it tax free. There we go. So I think that says that there's ways around it. Don't just go for tax free just because you think the other one's not. If you're not wanting a junior ISA, there are other ways. I love pensions. I love pensions. It was a real eye opener when I first found out that you could have a pension as a child. So anyone can have a pension. The allowance is simply 3,600 in total per year that can go into a pension, whether you're a child or whether you're, you're not working. So you can open up a pension on the day that they're born or any day in between. Anyone, again, can contribute to that. You get to put 2,880 in and then get the tax relief, giving you the 3,600. So free money for your children that they can't access like forever. So I think it's a really, really good way to add more to their savings, knowing they're not going to blow it at 18, hoping that by the time they get to 57, they might have learned some of the skills that some of us are still learning. What are your thoughts on children's pensions, Julie? Oh, I absolutely love this. I do this with a lot of my clients for their grandchildren. So first of all, even though children probably aren't paying income tax, 
they will still get income tax relief on the contributions, like Catherine said, the free money. We love the free money. But I think the thing I really like about it is it's the thought that these children are going to grow up having a pension. And it's passing on that savings habit down through the generation. Because if we think about our own children, the state of pension planning for them, it's not good. The state of pension planning for our generation, it's not good. So I just think it's setting them up for success from a very early age. That's what I get excited about. Mm. And I think, again, like the ISA conversations, it's knowing it's there and learning about it. OK, they, they're not going to get it forever in a day. And I guess when you're nine years old, the thought of not getting something until you're 57 probably really does feel almost imaginably long. But then as they enter like, through university and into young adulthood, and then when they start working and into an off to enrollment, this isn't all new to them. They're going to immediately recognize that there are real benefits to being engaged with their pension. And it's not going to seem like such a, a scary, what is this? What am I doing? It's coming out of my salary. Where's it going? What are all these words? Because they've had that opportunity to learn. So if a junior ISA is an ISA and a general investment's a naked ISA, is a pension like a really heavily dressed one, like in kind of lots of robes? Because it's superbly tax efficient, isn't it, out of all the three options? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a suitable name now for a pension. <laughs> It's like the superhero version. It's like black tie. Oh, black tie. There we go. Black tie ISA. If they were to pass away as adults or any age, there's no inheritance tax rate at that time. So of all the options, that is the black tie of, of, <laughs> of ISAs. As long as you're confident, comfortable that those savings you can put aside and will never need because you're not going to be able to access them and that child's not going to be able to access them until retirement age. Okay. Right. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope you found it useful. As always, we will put lots of links in the show notes. But if you've got any questions about anything we covered, get in touch. We're always happy to, to hear from you and answer your questions. But for now, take care. <laughs>